First of all, what did you study in your undergraduate and graduate programs and why? Okay, why? I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> uh, what did I study? I, my BA is in Communication Studies. My BA Honours is in Comparative Literature. I then have a, a French degree, a first degree, like a Master's in Sociology. Mm -hmm. And my PhD is in Sociology. Interesting. Why? Uh, because I have many questions about the world. and. I first went to university to study history, and the people with some theories were in literature, mm -hmm. and then in sociology. I didn't study translation. Um, when and how did you start focusing on translation studies? Okay, um, in my master's year, which is the fourth year, I did a dissertation on translation because it was, and that was in 1979, I wrote that, and because it was an interesting intellectual problem, because the linguistics of the day couldn't explain it, because I was in Australia, in a, in a minor culture, in a major language, at that stage I regretted the fact that we used English, I thought these lucky cultures that have translation to, to act as a barrier, mm. to control the flux of the foreign and the same, or what is what, what what belongs to to, to a culture, uh, and that's why, as a, as a purely intellectual problem, mm -hmm. uh, and only after writing that dissertation did I start to translate. I didn't translate before. I might add that I did that in 1979, and before or preparing for it, I travelled around Europe and I bought books on translation, and I think there were six, six or seven, very very few books. Neider, Steiner, uh, L'Admiral, Koller, not much else. What was the main focus of your dissertation at that time, 1979? You said translation, but... Ah, it's called, uh, it's for a political economy of translation. I was looking oh. for theories that could explain the way mm -hmm. um, exchanges operate between cultures, mm -hmm. in a fairly general theoretical sense. And you said you started doing translation practice. Mm. Okay. What kind of translations did you do? Oh, my first book was a book about the Spanish painter Goya, mm -hmm. uh, who finished his life in France, and this was a book written half in French and half in Spanish, and I translated, co-translated that into English. And then most of my professional work has been in, in sociology, economics, and politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what brought you to Tarragona? Um, we long had a house in a small village in the mountains inland mm -hmm. of Spain. I wanted to live in the village. We went there after returning from Germany where I was working at the time. And I applied for, job, for a job at the closest university. <laughs> so that's what I got and that's why I'm there. You don't want. You don't really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so you had taught in Germany. No, I had a postdoc. I had a postdoc in, post in Germany for two years. Okay. Yeah. And then moved to Spain. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, big question. Uh, how do you see the state of transition studies in general? The general. Uh, state? Extremely fragmented. I mm -hmm. think that there are very real problems. Um, not so much in the different countries, because that's there and we know it's there, but, but we're, we're, we, we can talk across those divides. Mm -hmm. But especially between what's being done in literary studies, literary translation, cultural translation especially, and the linguistic empirical side. Uh, we have massive resistance from both those sides. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is that the most interesting stuff is happening in technology, mm -hmm. for me in localization. And neither of these sides can really see what's going on there. So I think we, we have a dangerous fragmentation in terms of the disciplinary locations we're coming from mm -hmm. and the kinds of translations we're looking at. And a lot of work has to be done to, to keep the discipline as one or as a space of, of, of exchange. Mm. Well, now you mentioned cultural translation, I, I want to ask you more about cultural translation. Could you share your view 
Why do you want to know? Well, you just mentioned it. Well, I think okay. it's the term um, we see and hear more often yeah. nowadays. So I was wondering if you have any... Okay, because um, I've just finished writing that chapter of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's fresh in my mind and I managed to, well, I had to go over the text again. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised, firstly, at how vague the terms are and how much misunderstanding is there. Um, for me, cultural translation is, I, I use it in the sense that Homi Baba uses it, uh, which is looking at uh, hybrid texts that are operating on the border between cultures in terms of translation. Okay? It doesn't concern uh, cultural factors explaining translation. Uh, it, it doesn't concern the functions of translation within a culture. It's a way of looking at texts as if they were translations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find that incredibly stimulating mm -hmm. for translation theory. Mm -hmm. It throws up a whole lot of questions mm -hmm. about spe well, yeah, power relations, the, the presence uh, and the active role of the intermediary, mm -hmm. um, about globalization and the way it's affecting relations mm -hmm. between cultures. These are really, really important issues and I think too important to leave in the hands of literary theorists and cultural studies experts who at the end of the day exchange their opinions. Uh, I think we have to introduce an empirical element mm -hmm. into that set of problematics. Oh, you mentioned um, a fragmentation of translation studies, but uh, uh, recently there was an online discussion on integrating PhD programs in translation studies. Were no, they? no, no. It was no on, integrating. On okay. developing. On developing. We PhD had to get programs. rid of the term yes. integrating. PhD programs yeah. in translation yeah. studies. Were there any particular comments that inspired you or um, perhaps alarmed you? Um, I found nothing inspiring. No, because I think we're all. Everybody in that debate was speaking from their own perspective and uh, we're trying to justify what we do, including myself. And I think there was... We were looking at each other rather than speaking about any problem, okay? I was uh, perplexed at the statement from the American Translations and Interpreting Studies Association, ATISA, um, arguing well, first they argued that we don't need PhD programs in translation, but that's not surprising because I said the same thing to you in the in the previous uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the the previous interview. Uh, but uh, more or less saying uh, that PhDs in translation were going to be held in suspicion, especially if they came from outside the United States. I found this to be incredibly parochial. Mm and unfortunately broken. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, detrimental it, was the word that was used. Yeah, uh, okay, but, but a, a bad PhD is detrimental to whatever discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the suggestion was that there should not be this, this invasion. Look, the, the problem is here it's a very small, you can be big fish in a very small pond. There are very few scholars of translation in the United States. Uh, so a few people can, can, can do things, and it's great that that's being done. From the perspective of European and Canadian translation studies, we're now a pretty big pond with lots of, lots of medium-sized fish. And uh, if you're not aware of, that, of what's being done there, it's very hard to make such rash generalizations. Okay, next question. Uh, you have taught two semesters. Um, at Monroe Institute now, do you see any differences between students you have in Europe and students you, you have here in the States? Uh, what do you mean in the States? I mean, or, Monterey, Monterey yes. you have students from everywhere. Right. Um, especially from Pacific Rim. Right. Okay. So more, di and more diverse? Sure, but you have an international community here, mm -hmm. which is great, and I love that, I love teaching there. The students are really good, but they're good quality students when they come in. Mm -hmm. That's not a... I'm not, I'm not praising the institution, just the selection of the students. And the, um, the, the mix of students is, is great to teach, mm -hmm. too. We do get that in Europe in the summer schools, 
And I think that's the closest thing I can compare it to, something like the Centra Summer School, uh, where you get students who are bright, who are interested in the topic, they know where they want to go, and they're from very diverse backgrounds. And that's, that's been wonderful. What do you think of the role of uh, theory or research classes in a TNI professional school, such as Monterey Institute? As you might know, um, I set up a professional or vocational master's to train people in, uh, in uh, translation localization, now, now new technologies. And there is virtually no theory in that. Mm. I really do keep theory separate. Mm. Uh, there's a, there are four lessons on concepts and realities where I tried to give a few basic ideas to break with naive understandings of translation. Mm -hmm. That is, I talk about the end use, the receiver, mm -hmm. um, about the relative virtues of equivalence. Okay, basic scopos type things uh, are there to break with a naive understanding. But I certainly don't give a course on theory mm -hmm. uh, to train people who are going in, in, into the profession. They don't need it. They don't need it. They certainly don't need it. Uh, they might appreciate somebody to make them think about where they are and look critically around them. Mm -hmm. But that's about all theory should be doing mm -hmm. at that level. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, your, your students here are ostensibly being trained for a professional outcome. But I, I'm pleasantly surprised that quite a few of them are genuinely interested in the ideas. Uh, and, and would like to know more, mm -hmm. uh, just because they're intelligent people who, who, who will not go into the general ruck of the translation profession. They're being trained for the elite position. Uh, they're being trained for project managers, for example. Uh, they want to know where the industry is headed and uh, some biggish intellectual ideas mm -hmm. can be useful. And I'm getting very good feedback from these students as well. So I'll take it as far as they want it to go but I wouldn't force it on anybody. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we have a great number of students coming from Asia. Did you encounter something new, something different through the interactions with those students from what you're accustomed to in the European context? Sure, I mean, there, there are all the, uh, the traditional preconceptions some of which are true. When I get a large group and I ask somebody to volunteer an answer, mm -hmm. I'm not going to get it from the Asian students. <laughs> okay, with, with exceptions, because it's not, yeah, it's, it's not there. Uh, with time, though, and I, uh, part of my task is to force the different language groups to, to work with each other, to speak with each other, uh, with time they become more interactive, they have more to say, and especially through the written side. I find uh, that even if it's not happening in class, I get it through the exercises. In, in the book, um, one, almost a page, is from the work done with these students. Mm. Uh, we, were, we were testing out Wiener Dabelne's categories. I expected them not to work at all mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Asian languages. Mm. Uh, these categories were developed, these are categories of translation strategies or techniques mm. developed for French and English. What happens when it's Japanese? Mm -hmm. And English. I said, well, it's not going to work at all. And I was surprised it did work, more or less. Uh, uh, except that Vine and Dabelne assume that the mm -hmm. default strategy will be something like literal translation, mm -hmm. word for word. Mm -hmm. Here, clear shift, the default strategy was transposition. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a background. Mm -hmm. the, the, the descriptions, it's an arbitrary description, it could be different. Uh, but the whole game shifts uh, up one level uh, of creativity, if you like. And, uh, and that came from the work we did in class with the students and from what they had to say. And that is reflected in your book? I even put in brackets my thanks to the <laughs> students. <laughs> 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 it's a whole palagot, of course. <laughs> Yeah, and, and other things as well. Yeah. I, I've got critical feedback yeah. over the years. But the, the chapters of the book I've been teaching since, nine, since uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. So I've been teaching those at different places in Australia, in mm -hmm. Spain, and here. Mm -hmm. And I've got a lot of feedback from a lot of students mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and professors.
professors mm. uh, over the past five years. That's, that's wonderful. Mm. So now you mentioned your book. I want to ask you about um, why five paradigms? Why you chose those five paradigms? And what will be the sixth paradigm? Hold on, I don't know if there are five anymore. <laughs> No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Equivalence, the Skopos thing, description, localization. Indeterminacy. Uncertainty, yeah, I changed that to uncertainty. Uncertainty. I'm trying to make things easier to understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, no, there is a, the sixth is, uh, is cultural Ocean translation. translation. Okay. Right. So there are six already. Okay. Yeah, it keeps growing. Um, keeps growing. People in, in Routledge wanted more post-colonial things put in. Mm -hmm. I can attach that to the cultural translation. Mm -hmm. So... But that's there as a as a request from the potential publisher. Potential publisher. Yeah, okay. Potential publisher. Uh, what would be the seventh thing? Is yeah. That the well, that was a part of the question. That uh, um, my original, the first question was: Do you see there are a number of paradigms in translation studies? And you picked five or six major ones. Or no, I didn't see paradigms. You don't. You can't see paradigms because if you're in it, you don't know you're in it. You can only see misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And and when I see people using the term translation and not understanding what the other person mm -hmm. means by mm -hmm. that term translation, mm -hmm. there are probably two paradigms at work, like the confusions around mm -hmm. cultural translation, um, and the confusions between uh, what Skopos theory mm -hmm. says about translation and what the equivalence people mm -hmm. say. You can see the distinction, you can see the boundary between mm -hmm. paradigms when there are people talking at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of those around. Uh, so all the paradigms, I think, ha have got there that way. Mm. They're really explaining misunderstandings that are being perceived. Uh, I don't know what the next one is. I mean. If it's a question of, of, of what theory could mm -hmm. be developed, I, I'm, I've been working on risk management yes, as a theory right, for a right. number of years yeah, now. Yeah. And I haven't put that in the book mm. because it's not a paradigm. It, it hasn't been out there, it hasn't been discussed, it hasn't, mm -hmm. you know, nobody's fighting against it or for right, it particularly. Right, right, right. Um, so it doesn't really have a right to be in the book. Okay. Yet. Uh, there will be a last chapter, a very short one, mm -hmm. uh, Make Your Own Theory. Mm. at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. And I'll you just, talk about your own theory? I'll use that as an example. Mm -hmm. example. I'll just mm -hmm. say to people, look, you identify problems, mm -hmm. uh, think, of, think of what theories you can use to help mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And most of the theories we have in translation, mm -hmm. to be honest, have come from other disciplines. Mm -hmm. They've been brought in, transformed as they're brought mm -hmm. into, into translation studies. And the next one will be that way like risk management. And you look forward to a debate on that risk management theory? Oh, no, it's going to be the perfect universal explanation for all the problems <laughs> here. There will be no debate. <laughs> of course, of course, that's, that's why you do theory to, to right. argue. Yeah. To me, risk management can be used in interpreting studies as well. And um, I've been thinking about it, but on general terms, what should translation studies learn from interpreting studies and vice versa? Okay, I, I don't believe in the division between mm. the oral and the written. Okay, historically it doesn't hold up because the orality was there first. For the centuries I studied in, in Hispanic history, mm -hmm. the spoken and the written were carried on in the one process. Mm -hmm. Okay, you had two translators speaking and then one wrote it down. Mm -hmm. uh, our new technologies mean that we're going to be speaking our translations again. Uh, we'll be skipping over the written. Uh, so sight translation is going to become incredibly important. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to maintain that artificial distinction uh, between interpreting studies and translation studies. Even more so, the eye-tracking experiments mm -hmm. um, can show you that, that uh, written translators working on uh, with a computer are working with some simultaneity. Mm -hmm. So the one thing that would typify hardcore central conference interpreting and interpreting studies can also be found. Mm -hmm. 
I'm very excited about rereading all the work, all, all the psychological work, the cognitive studies work that's been done on interpreting and asking afresh to what extent that applies to written translation. That is bringing across that empirical cognitive work into translation studies and then the other way the awareness of contextual determinants, political determinants, uh, the fact that, that all mediation is highly structured by its situation, bringing that across into interpreting studies. So there are two movements that can be carried out there. But, but, but it, it is true that there are scholars in translation studies who only focus on translation and they don't pay much attention to interpreting. And vice versa. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, you mentioned before that your vocational MA program students do not study theory necessarily. Um, how does theory get, get along with practice and vice versa? Classics question. Yeah, yeah. Theory and practice. Mm. Um, I try not to give a banal answer. Mm. Um, one of the ideas that interests me is that, okay, in between the theory and the practice, mm -hmm. no, no, first thing, every practice involves theorizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, everything we do involves inventing suppositions about why we're doing it mm -hmm. and how far we get there. When it doesn't work, we go back and rethink mm -hmm. our ideas. And that's just everyday practice. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm cooking, I'm theorizing about mm -hmm. cooking. And, 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 and when I'm translating, I'm theorizing about translating, um, especially for the, the operations that are no longer automatic. Okay? Uh, so there's, there's, it's involved closely there. And if we can recognize that and get back to that close involvement of theory and practice, the written theories will be much better. We'll realize that there are, the problems appear in practice and they are solved in practice. Uh, uh, the theorizing just helps us get a clearer idea of what's going on and, 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 and gives us a language with which to talk with other people about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. It's just a way of communicating so we can work together to solve problems. Okay. Uh, wait, though, there's more. In between that, there is a thing called research. Mm -hmm. And what I'm interested in now is the way that empirical research can give a voice to things that are not heard. Uh, for example, uh, when we do experiments with eye tracking, with, with transmog or whatever, on the way translators work when they go fast, we discover things that not even the translators are, are aware about, but they're there. And you, you write that up, it's all of the graphs, and you, 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 pr you present an article or you present the material as I did the other day. That's a way of a practice getting a voice to talk to the theorists, to the academics, but also to the professionals. That's a talk I gave to the Northern, Translate, Northern California Translators Association, to a group of professionals, mm -hmm. right. saying, here you are translating, mm -hmm. or does this seem to be right? Is mm -hmm. this what happens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's using theory as a way of giving a voice to what is otherwise silent. And I think that's very exciting. That comes from Bourdieu, who said, you know, sociology gives a voice to the people mm -hmm. who don't really participate in society. Perhaps our research can do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, some people talk about translation studies uh, being Eurocentric, and they advocate de-Westernization of translation studies. Um, can you do? You, do you have any comments on that? De-Westernization. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I don't. No, I I don't know. <laughs> Uh, one thing bothers me about, we're getting a lot of translation studies from China mm -hmm. these days, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot from the Middle East as well, okay? Um, and I find all of that tremendously interesting, except when it's recycled Western stuff, 20 years later. You know, I, I get from China a lot of comments on Eugene Nida. Well, all right, that's fair enough, but... but our debate is no longer there. Right. And, uh, and, and from the Middle East, we get lots of uh, proposed articles on uh, text analysis of how not to translate the Quran. That's fine, but 
you know, mainstream translation studies is no longer on the level of, of text of comparative text analysis. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, qu I, I'm really interested in what that would mean, the de-westernization. Mm -hmm. What I see is, is, is a reflection mm -hmm. of the West, which is not serving anybody particularly well. Uh, if it involves going back to the basic problems of mm -hmm. cultural mediation mm -hmm. in, in the Asian world, or between Asia and, uh, and, and the extended West, uh, that will be tremendously interesting. Okay? Uh, you're going to get fundamental debates, like the debates about uh, Asian values and universal ethics. These are the main debates of our day. You could argue about translation ethics mm -hmm. in the same way, but it's right. not being done. I find a lot of, of quite banal copying of old ideas uh, from the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, I'm not particularly apologetic about working from a Western tradition, mm -hmm. since that tradition is also the one that built the institutions we work in and the, the media with which we're communicating, the, the, the journals and the, uh, the library system. So there, there is, on that level, on, on the idea of what is learning, what is education, what is a university, etc. There's not East or West. There, there is a global system that we're all operating in. And I don't feel the need to apologize for that. Um, there are a lot of things happening in the world. Um, it's a difficult time, but it's also an interesting time, I think. As a scholar of translation studies, what phenomena in the current world affairs interest you most? Well, from the perspective of translation studies, um, or you, your personal perspective? No, I, I don't think. I think I'm getting old enough not to worry about the day-to-day -day crises that will appear now and appear, you know. Uh, I'm more interested and more excited about the effect that electronic technologies are having on us. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that's if you, if you get back and look at the world in terms of centuries mm -hmm. and, and, and five centuries, groups of five centuries, or thousands of years, yeah. uh, the big changes are in the technology. And we're in the middle of a huge technological shift mm -hmm. from print media to electronic media, the return of orality into our communications, the modes of presentiality with audiovisual communication, I think that's going to change a whole lot about, mm -hmm. not just the way translators work, but mm -hmm. about the way different cultures interrelate. Mm -hmm. And those are the sort of problems we should be working on, not, not, not what happens to North Korea this week or the economic crisis this year or for the next two years. These things will come and go. Uh, okay. Um, uh I think you mentioned um, Federation of Translation Studies schools or programs before. Could you could you share with us your vision for the Federation of uh, Translation Studies schools and programs? Uh, I no hold on. There there is um, there's a fit. There's, a, there's an international federation of translators. Okay, and there's the AIC for conference interpreters, and those are professional associations, mm -hmm. more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that we do need a way to cooperate better mm -hmm. on the level of translation studies, not necessarily training. Mm -hmm. I don't know, perhaps training as well. I, I'm really not too sure there, but certainly within translation studies, mm -hmm. if you know, our, our recent discussion was about PhD programs. Mm -hmm. And I think, obviously, if people have resources and other people can use those yeah. resources, yeah. and there's not economic conflict involved, uh, then we should do that. A lot can be done mm -hmm. you know, yeah, along those lines. Uh, we have I, the International Association of Translation and Intercultural Studies, uh, which is doing a lot of good work uh, along those lines. Um, but it hasn't attracted the national associations. That is, we have one international association, mm -hmm. we have a European Society for Translation right. Studies, we have another one in Brazil, mm -hmm. another one in Japan, another one in Korea, mm -hmm. and a very active one in Canada, mm -hmm. and probably others, but these are the ones, I'm, and the United States. I think so. I don't know about them. Uh, 
They are operating in their national context mm -hmm. and they are not members, they're not affiliated mm -hmm. with the International Association. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me we've got something, a disconnect yeah. here between mm -hmm. what's been done in these different mm -hmm. contexts mm -hmm. and what's been done internationally, which is basically a big conference every mm -hmm. two, three, four years, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It would make sense for me, for the national associations, to get in touch with each other and cooperate. Uh, also because as much as we don't like nationalism and we don't think translation studies is nationalized, our education systems are. Mm. And it's within those systems that we have to uh, uh, promote the cause of translation studies. So I think those are just general ideas. I don't know which way that will go. Mm -hmm. What are your next research projects? What's cooking? What's in the pipeline? Ah, well, research projects, as you know, are always of the one you've just done. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. No, that we, we're, no. Mm -hmm. in this, this January we will apply for funding. Mm -hmm. um, this is my research group in, mm -hmm. in Spain. Uh, for a project called Risk Management of New Translation Technologies. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing in the theory of risk management and looking at a series of projects involving machine translation, translation memories, professional um, situation of workers in the localization industry, that is job satisfaction as a variable, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, quality measurements with respect to end use, usability. Uh, and that'll be a fairly big uh, project for three years. Uh, that's what we can do and that's what has to be done, I think, mm -hmm. um, both with respect to research and the industry. It involves cognitive work on speed, mm -hmm. especially, <clears throat> and quite sociological work with respect to the localization industry. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll be doing. <coughs> I need water. Do you have any water? I'll be back in a minute. So, okay. can you stop that? Excuse me. Sorry, sir. It's not about. Okay. It's not about the book, is it? It's about the book now. Oh, okay. okay, the last question. <laughs> any Any message for in Japan who will read your book? <laughs> you don't have to read at all. <laughs> no, I think I, I'm aware, um, like academics, if I'm not controlled, mm -hmm. I'll say more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a book that went from a very, for a series of five lectures, mm -hmm. which all of which are 20 minutes long, okay, and then more and more things go in, more explanations go mm -hmm. in. Uh, so you get um, people who like the first chapters because they want something they can use, they want to use know about equivalence and, 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 and actually analyze texts as translations, translations as texts, will hate the last chapters, uh, which moves into cultural translation and cultural theory and globalization, etc. And vice versa, the people who are interested in the last chapters will not think there's anything really of interest in the, in the first chapters. Mm -hmm. And I just hope that somewhere out there, yeah. somebody yeah. will be able to get from the beginning to the end. You can skip a lot of pages, stuff that doesn't interest you. But, but a discipline has to at least present the range of what's out there, so people are aware that it's there. Yeah. Yeah? I thought this book was meant for students of translation studies, sure. who are just learning Theories. Yeah, the students don't read. Each chapter has a summary at the beginning and, and a recapitulation <laughs> at the end, because I know you're not going to read it all. Okay, and that way you you'll be able to get the overview and not have to read all the boring stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and where it does interest people, mm -hmm. uh, then I, I've tried to put in a lot of um, further you know, in, indications of further reading and a few anecdotes and things to stimulate interest. So but it's not a book that I imagine people are going to read from beginning to end. But isn't there like a flow or a genealogy of translation theories? You know, it makes sense to start reading a chapter of equivalence and then to localization or cultural translation. It's not, uh, the, the sequence is not historical. It is more or less in terms mm. of fashion, mm -hmm. of what's been fashionable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, for example, if I was to put, 
put the ideas in terms of historical sequence, mm -hmm. the first would be uncertainty. I would start with, with the, the paradigm of, of, of deconstruction, if you like, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's, that's 1923. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, in a sense, I've arranged mm -hmm. things pedagogically because most people in translation studies will be starting from equivalence. Okay? And, and then the natural responses that have occurred in translation mm -hmm. studies. Mm -hmm. But I'm also trying to look at a history of ideas mm -hmm. And in the history of ideas, yeah. you know, the uncertainty yeah. paradigm was, yeah. was there first. Yeah. And today, all those paradigms are continuing. Yeah. It's not like one died so the other could live. Yeah. They're all operating simultaneously yeah. Yeah. to the greater confusion yeah. of translation yeah. studies. This may be a, a difficult question, but do you see, um, um, you know, the, uh, there is a book by Mo Monday. Uh, introducing translation studies. Do you think your book would be um, complementary? Yeah. Twin with yeah, there's a problem. I, I've been writing without looking at Jeremy's very good book. I mean, I, I read it prior to giving the course in 2003, so I read the first edition, mm. and I haven't looked at it because otherwise I'd be copying things mm. out. And I haven't looked at Gensler, and mm. I haven't looked at, at Larry Venuti's reader mm. either. Mm. So I'm just working on the text as best I can. Mm. Uh, now, if this gets accepted by Routledge, I have to go over it <laughs> and eliminate where we say the same things oh. and do the cross-referencing. So it will be a book in the Routledge stable. Mm -hmm. If they don't accept it, then mm -hmm. I put it all back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know, your, your, your Japanese version will be published by the same publishing company that will be publishing the So the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how, how should, he's also my editor, how should he market your book? Ah? Uh, no, it is, it is um, firstly, uh, Jeremy's book is on translation studies as a research field. Mine is really on theories and ideas. Okay. It's a course in theories. Mm -hmm. I, I intentionally don't go into a lot of empirical research. Mm -hmm. I don't give a lot of mm -hmm. examples which mm -hmm. would involved going into mm -hmm. the empirical research. So there's that difference. I also insist on the intellectual context um, of those ideas, uh, whereas Jeremy's doesn't, because his is, is an introduction. Uh, mine is really for people who want to take it a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. And I would see it at, you know, it's a master's level mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. uh, for people who want to go into things a bit more depth and focus on the ideas and not just the uh, the research program. Great. Is there anything else you want to say about your book? Uh, no, Jeremy's book is very good. <laughs> 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 and and uh, the Venuti read is very good too. Actually, you know, I have to, a lot of cross-referencing has to go to that where you have some of the essential Do you think that should be uh, revised? Maybe the second version? Venuti's... Uh, well, there is a, a revised version good. out. Yeah, with, with rad quite radical changes. Mm. I mean, it's not the selection I would have made, but it's the best selection that's out there. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.